So George Washington was going to be the first president and everyone knew it for a couple of reasons. First, he was really like the most famous man in the world at that point. The only other person that maybe rivaled that fame was Benjamin Franklin, but he was very old and in poor health and everyone knew he was really not up to the demands of the job. Second, Washington was really seen as a national figure. He wasn't seen as much of a Virginian. And that was because he had served as the commander in chief of the Continental Army and had been all over the country over the last eight years, which is something that relatively few people did. Lastly, he had demonstrated that he could be trusted with that type of power. He had wielded enormous authority during the war and given it back. And at a time when people were very worried about monarchies and dictatorships and authoritarian regimes, having that proof that someone was willing to give it back was an extraordinary thing and very unusual. And um, so really gave people confidence that he would be a good president. Okay. When Washington came into office, the presidency was really just an idea. It was written down in very few words in Article Two of the Constitution, but things like how the president would act, how the president would dress, how the president would interact with other branches of government, whether or not the president would travel to go see American citizens, how much power the president actually had day to day over domestic and foreign policy issues was really all up in the air. And so Washington's presidency was essential in crafting the expectations for daily comportment, for daily activities, but also for establishing precedent that when there was domestic crisis, we expect the president to act. We don't expect Congress necessarily to take the lead. When there is a foreign policy question, when there is a threat of war, we expect the president to act. And Washington was the one that took action and set those expectations such that he was establishing precedent for those that followed. Other countries have actually really always watched the American experiment. You know, in some ways we like to talk about American exceptionalism and some of those claims are not well founded, but other nations really have always watched the American project because when we started, we were doing something so new and so unique. And the revolutionary rhetoric was inspiring to other revolutions. The European powers were sometimes very happy for us to fail because it would be an opportunity to seize authority or trade or money or resources. So they weren't necessarily always rooting for success. When Washington decided he was going to retire, it was a shocking moment. It was totally revolutionary. And King George III reportedly said that that would make him the greatest man in the world. Now, whether or not, I mean, that evidence is a little bit fuzzy, but I think that it is emblematic of the response of, wow, we cannot believe this is actually happening. It was essential to Washington and the nation to establish a peaceful transfer of power really at the center of the democratic process because that is what characterizes a democracy. We go to the ballots, we select someone, that person wins. If it is taken by force, it is no longer a democracy or a republic or a democratic republic, whatever language you want to use to describe it. Mm -hmm. And they understood that that characteristic was central to the type of government they were trying to create. They had seen firsthand examples of the other types of transition. And so in order to preserve the democratic project or experiment, as they called it, it had to be a peaceful transfer or it no longer would survive. <laughs>